Welcome. So this is the last part of chapter five, which is sort of a special topic. Um, and this gets at the heart of thinking about what monetary policy does and the impacts of monetary policy. So this continues on with this liquidity, liquidity preference framework and thinking about the play between money, the money market and the bond market. But it focuses in particular on what the actual effects of interest rate uh, of changes in monetary policy have in terms of the interest rate. Um, we've seen the direct effects in terms of this liquidity impact where if the money supply goes up, then the interest rates are going to go down and vice versa. But what's going on behind the scenes is that we don't live in a ceteris paribus world. We know that when interest rates change, then that has secondary effects in the real economy. And that, as it turns out, can feed back into um, what happens in the money market and the bond market, and hence feedback in terms of interest rates. And so it turns out um, that if we look at, how do I, oh, here we go. Oops. It turns out that if we look at, uh, again, the basic mechanics of monetary policy, if we have uh, an expansionary monetary policy, then as we've seen in the past, that means the, there's going to be an increase in the money supply that drives the money supply curve to the right, and that pushes down interest rates. Okay, so this is what's referred to as the liquidity effect, and this is really where the rubber hits the road in terms of monetary policy and why monetary policy can be effective. When the interest rate falls, that makes it cheaper to borrow, consumption goes up, investment goes up, and that has real impacts on the economy. Okay, so that's sort of the, the direct effect of monetary policy is through this liquidity effect. Money, money supply goes up, interest rates go down, and vice versa. Okay, um, but as it turns out, as I said before, we don't live in a ceteris paribus world, and we don't live in a vacuum. So there's separate things that go on uh, once this happens, um, which are sort of indirect or what we uh, can refer to as feedback effects. So for instance, there's uh, what's referred to as the income effect here. Okay, what do we do when we pursue expansionary monetary policy? Presumably, incomes go up. And as we talked about in, um, earlier in the chapter, when income goes up, then people want to buy more goods, and money demand therefore rises. And so because of this, you would expect when the income effect kicks in that this money demand curve is going to be pulling up. And that is going to, if we don't, if we don't do anything else with monetary policy, that means that uh, interest rates are going to creep back up again. Okay? There's also a couple other things going on here. So, for instance, there's what's referred to as the price level effect. Again, with expansionary policy, that generally uh, results in higher prices overall. And as we talked about in the previous video, with higher prices, if people want to buy the same amount of goods and services they did in the past, then they have to have more money to be able to do so. So with a one-time increase in the price level, people need more money to buy those same goods. And therefore, again, that would contribute to pulling money demand up and therefore would also contribute to increasing interest rates a bit, okay? There's also what's referred to the expected inflation effect. Now, this is distinctly different from the price level effect. The idea here is that with the price level effect, you could have simply a one-time increase in the price level, and inflation could stay exactly the same, okay? With that one-time increase in the price level, again, you need more money to buy the same goods. Money demand goes up. Now, the expected inflation part of it really comes back through to thinking about how the bond market mechanics operate. With this expansionary policy, again, it could be the case that we should expect sustained higher inflation in the, uh, in the future, and so therefore expected inflation is going to rise. Now, what we saw with expected inflation, there's two effects in the bond market, right? So higher expected inflation means lower cost of borrowing, so bond supply rises. The flip side of that is that with higher expected inflation, the real return for bondholders goes down, so bond demand decreases. And what we saw in previous videos is that that's going to, through the bond market, and again, you can draw this on your own, that's going to result in an unambiguous decline in the price of bonds and an unambiguous increase in interest rates. Okay. So the flip side of that in this sense here is that that really acts to um, increase money demand in a similar fashion to this. So we have these indirect or feedback effects, which all of them are reinforcing in terms of essentially pulling money demand up and resulting in higher equilibrium interest rates. So now we have this sudden 
uh, tug of war between this direct effect of the liquidity effect pushing interest rates down versus these indirect or feedback effects, which are trying to pull interest rates up. And again, these things all aren't instantaneous. They take place over time. And so we'll see that depending upon the timing of these effects, as well as the magnitude of these effects, they can have differential impacts on the interest rate and the path of interest rates over time. So to consider that, what we're going to do is we're going to look at three sort of separate baseline cases, again, to sort of understand the interplay between this liquidity effect, which is the way we think monetary policy should work, versus these things that are pushing against it, these feedback effects. And so, as I said before, this has implications for thinking about the stance of monetary policy, the effectiveness of monetary policy, and really what monetary policy actually does. Okay. And so to do that, here's the first case, and we're going to call this case A. Um, and so, again, this is sort of the typical way in which we think about monetary policy working. Okay? Let's conduct an expansionary monetary policy to drive down interest rates and hopefully uh, try to maybe get out of a recession or something like this. So I'm going to sort of characterize this loosely as a situation of normal expansionary monetary policy, say, during a recession. Okay? So the, the, the point of this is to drive down interest rates, raise consumption, raise investment, and hopefully that pulls us out of a, a recession. And so this, look like, this might look fairly complicated, but if we go through it step by step, hopefully it will be uh, relatively clear. So let's start at point A here, okay? So you can see the, the red graph here. That's at interest rate I1. And so when we pursue this expansionary monetary policy, then what's going to happen, as we've seen before, the money supply is going to rise. This liquidity effect kicks in, right? So holding everything else constant, you would expect the money supply to shift to the right. That's going to drive down interest rates to I1. That I1, or sorry, this I hat, rather, this fictitious interest rate that we don't actually see, is going to be somewhere down here. So merely the effect of that liquidity effect is going to push us to that point there. Okay. Now, what about these feedback effects? Well, again, these feedback effects, the price level, the expected inflation, the income effects, those are all secondary effects which happen over time. So as the economy expands, as price level goes up, as income rises and expected inflation uh, goes up a bit, you would expect that this money demand curve is going to be shifting out over time. And as you can see, as this money demand drifts up over time, the interest rate is going to rise over time. And eventually, we should end up at some longer-run equilibrium here at point C. So in this case here, this is the typical sort of textbook way in which we would think about monetary policy operating. Increase the money supply that drives down interest rates. The net effect is lower interest rates. And hopefully, that um, leads to higher expansion in, in incomes and consumption. OK. So here's a different case. Let's call this case B. So this case you might, again, think about as an expansionary policy. And this could be, for instance, when this is close to full employment. So if the economy is near its capacity and the central bank decides for whatever reason to try to expand the economy further, that's where you can get into these problems of inflationary policy. And that's where these feedback effects kick in. So again, what happens here is we start off right here at point A. OK. And what's going to happen is at point A, we decide to pursue this expansionary monetary policy that drives down interest rates through this liquidity effect. Right? So we have this, again, we have this shift in the money supply 
to here. We would see point B at some point. But then these secondary, these feedback effects kick in, income, price level, and expected inflation effects. Those all have the impact of pushing this money demand curve upward over time. Okay, And that, of course, drives up interest rates higher. And the key difference between this example and the previous one is that these feedback effects dominate the initial impact of the liquidity effect. So it's delayed in that sense, but then they kick in and they end up uh, overcoming the, the initial liquidity effect. So the end result is you end up at a higher interest rate than what you actually started at. Okay, And that's partly because of the fact that you can think of this as a sort of a, an inflationary policy. If we're conducting policy when we're near capacity and we're expanding the money supply, then that's not necessarily uh, a smart policy prescription. So here's the third case. I like to think of this case as the case of Zimbabwe. If you know anything about Zimbabwe, they had out of control inflation rates of a bazillion percent. Um, and a lot of it is due simply to money growth. And high rates of money growth led to really high rates of inflation expectations. Okay. So this case is a little bit different in that we have these liquidity and expected inflation effects happening sort of at the same time. So because of that and because of the, the very strong impact of higher inflation expectations in this expansionary case, then we don't see a decline in interest rates. We see immediate increase in interest rates. Okay. So even though the money supply initially shifts out, we also have increases in expected inflation that happen sort of simultaneously to that. So the net effect between the two is that we end up at point B where the interest rate is higher, oops, where the interest rate is actually higher as a result. So the combined effects of the liquidity and expected inflation effects put us at point B at a higher interest rate. And then of course, later on, as this income and price level effects kick in, then that's gonna further drive up money demand for the reasons we talked about. Higher incomes mean people need to buy more goods, they need more money, and the price level effect also um, raises money demand. So the net effect is over time, interest rates continue to drift upward until we end up at point I2, okay? And so you can see all three of these sort of side by side and contrast and compare them um, to see um, you know, how, they, how they play out. But the punchline here is a couple things. So first of all, it gets us thinking again about the impacts of monetary policy and what monetary policy does, right? And so really the question is, well, does expansionary monetary policy actually work? And in particular, does it drive down interest rates? And the answer to that, if you're a really good economist, the, the answer, of course, is, well, maybe, right? So that's what co economists do a lot of, is they say, well, on the one hand, on the other hand. And so it depends a lot on these various factors, and in particular, the impact of these feedback effects. So the other implication for this is to think about the stance of monetary policy. Oftentimes, we like to think about what the Fed is doing and uh, think about the, the level of interest rates and how that uh, factors into um, a broader sort of policy prescription. And so the, the moral of the story here is that with expansionary policy, you can get varying outcomes in terms of what the interest rate actually does, not only in the levels, but the path of those interest rate effects. And so simply looking at the level of interest rates in and of itself doesn't necessarily say anything about the stance of monetary policy. Again, we think of high interest rates as being contractionary and low interest rates as being expansionary. But in this, these cases here, we saw instances in which expansionary policy can either result in high, medium, or sort of low interest rates. And so that's something um, that we need to be careful of as well. Thank you.